And let us begin with the word of prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the Sabbath and the blessings of fellowship, both with you and with your children through thy spirit. We are thankful for the gift of Christ, his life, his example, his character. And we just ask, Lord, that as we study together, that uh, you can clearly show that we can clearly have a revelation of Christ, that we can know that he loves us and that he is seeking to live in us. We pray that our hearts can be open to him knocking at that door. And we ask, Lord, that you can lead and guide in this study today, and that it may be a blessing to each one. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, happy Sabbath again, everyone. And um, now what you are looking at there on the screen is from the 1863 chart. Now, the 1843 chart, does it have the week of Christ on it? I don't see it on there. Yeah, on the 1843 chart, it's not there. It's, the 70 weeks is not actually there. They don't give the date. If you look on the 1843 chart, uh, you're not going to have, you're going to have the, the cross there, but not the date for the cross. Now, Miller believed that the cross occurred in uh, 33 AD, and at the time they made the 1843 chart, they had the crucifixion of Christ in 33 AD. But in God's providence, that date wasn't put on the 1843 chart. Now, what about the 1850 chart? Does the 1850 chart have the 70 weeks on it or the 70th week? I would say the 70th week, possibly. Okay. Yes, yeah, right, right in the mi middle of it. In, in the 1850 chart? Yeah. Okay. Well, it has the cross, but I'm saying, does it have the the week of Christ? So That's 31, um, 34 AD. Yeah. So they're going to have the the 34 AD, and they're also going to have AD 31. Okay. So they're going to have AD 31 on the chart, and they're going to have the end of the 70 weeks. Right. So so on the 1850 chart, they do. Now they don't have 27 AD on the 1850 chart. So they put the 34 AD and they put the 31 AD. But on the 1860 chart is the first time you're going to see this laid out. Now, we know that the 1863 chart has this laid out, but the 1863 chart does not have the 2520 on it. So, so we see a progression with the week of Christ. That is, we have the starting point on the 1843 chart of 457 BC because that starts the 2300 days. They definitely have the cross there, but not uh, a date for it. And then on the 1850 chart, they're going to have a date for the cross, at least the year, and um, and the date for the end of the 70 weeks. So 34 AD, they're going to have that. Uh, but they don't have 27 AD. And of course, you know, it would be implied in a way. Now, when we're addressing, because what we're addressing right now is the symbolic use of numbers and, and the purpose of them. So just kind of as a review, and, and I'm not sure, you know, I, I mean, I have whether I'm going to get everything done today or next Sabbath will be the last presentation on the symbolic use of numbers. I don't know. Um, there may be other things that come up that uh, I can think of right now. I. I'm trying to sum this up, this study. Um, so let's go here. So one, one of the, the main scriptures that, that we have looked at in addressing the symbolic use of numbers and, and studying Bible prophecy is the 70 weeks. So we know with the 70 week prophecy uh, that we have these symbols, uh, obviously, uh, the 490 years is an important symbol, plus the seven weeks, which is 49 years, the Jubilee cycle, and the one week, the sabbatical cycle, and the 62 weeks, which divided into two is two periods of 31, and each of those are 217 years. 31 weeks is 217 years, and, and that's a symbol for midnight or the midst of the week, July 7th in 1844, 
or July 7th, July 21st in 1844. So July 21st is midway in 1844. And we can see that if we take 31 times 7, it will give us uh, 217, which is a symbol for July 7th, or July 21st, pardon me. Keep doing that. Uh, July 21st, which is uh, Boston, right? It's when we have uh, the middle of what we call midnight, the middle of that time of tarrying, the middle of the tarrying time. So this 70 weeks contains lots of symbols uh, that tie us to Millerite history, right? It's also the start, of course, for the 2300 days, which is going to bring us to Millerite history. And we know that, uh, you know, Christ is crucified in the midst of the week. Symbolically, it's three and a half years and three and a half years. We know literally it's not exactly three and a half years from his baptism to the cross and exactly three and a half years uh, from the cross to the stoning of Stephen. If we looked at uh, the days, it's not exactly the middle. Now, when I was began studying this chronology, so, I mean, I've been studying chronology ever since I was an Adventist and, and actually before I had an interest in calendars. As a teenager, and I'm interested in astronomy, right? So, uh, you know how how orbits work, and how the Moon uh, Earth system worked, and how um, you know how we could, uh, you know, how the Moon worked, and and uh, the phases of the Moon, and the lengths of the of a year, and and those types of things. I always had interest in them. Obviously, I have a much deeper understanding of these things now than I did. When I was a teenager, because I've studied them a lot longer. But when, when I first started looking at Adventism, I mean, I, I kept the Sabbath first before I was an Adventist. And then I didn't really start looking at Adventism until after I was baptized, really. Um, and I read Kingdom of the Cults by Walter Martin and, uh, recognized that chronology was really important for Seventh day Adventists at the 2300 days. Um, you know, if, if, if the 2300 day prophecy was calculated incorrectly, then uh, Adventism would be based upon something that was an error. And so I knew some of the objections that that would happen with Adventism. And so I began examining these things to see is Adventism based on reality or not. Right. So as I continued to study, I didn't have enough information necessarily to to know 100 percent. Um, I looked at what the Adventist pastors and what the Adventist book said about 457 BC and about 31 AD and about 1844. And it was not until I got into this movement and studied the 2520 that I believe that I had sufficient reason from a, we'll say, a, a scientific point of view to accept the chronology of the Seventh-day Adventist Church that, that we had had, that, that had been presented to me. That is, I had doubts prior to being in this movement. Now, didn't mean that, you know, I didn't believe that God was leading the church or so, or so forth, but I did know that there were problems that we had and that many of the claims that were made by Seventh-day Adventists regarding the 2300 days and the 70 weeks were incorrect. That is, many Seventh-day Adventists believe that um, that it's in the seventh year of Artaxerxes that the 2300 days begin and that the 70 weeks begin. Do they begin in the seventh year of Artaxerxes? Does the 2300 days commence in the seventh year of Artaxerxes? No, in the eighth year. Yeah, it's in the eighth year, right? That is... It says in the seventh year, you know, Artaxerxes issues this decree and, and then, you know, Ezra is going to take that decree. And on the first day of the first month, he's going to leave Babylon. He gets to the river Ahava. They hang around there for three days after dividing the gold and silver to the, the priests. And, and some people go back to fat, fetch some Levites to go along. And on the twelfth day of the first month, uh, they continue their journey to Babylon. That still would be in the seventh year of Artaxerxes, right? It says in the first day of the fifth month in the seventh year. But 
since they're counting it fall to fall, and the first day of the seventh month is actually the start of the eighth year of Arctic Xerxes. And we've shown in other places that the 70 weeks and the 2300 days begin on the 10th day of the seventh month, that the Jews would actually consider that the eighth year of Arctic Xerxes. So, um, so obviously it's not the seventh year. So I've seen statements where Adventists definitely don't have an understanding of the 70 weeks, a, a good understanding uh, generally. And, and I would say almost specifically that there are very few Adventist scholars who even have a good understanding of it. There are some, but there are many. I mean, they'd have to pretty much be a, a specialist in this area uh, to really know all the details. And definitely our pastors don't have a clue in a general sense. So they just repeat things that they've heard. And so I knew this. I knew that there were these problems. So back in 2014, when I really began to put some of this stuff together, uh, the chronology, working out the chronology of the kings of Judah and Israel, uh, working out the chronology of the prophetic periods, recognizing uh, the 390 years and the 40 years, not not having um, in 2014, I still hadn't connected it to the prophecy of Josiah, but I still had those spans of time. And the 666 years uh, from Jehoiachin's captivity to um, the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, things like that. I had put together a lot of these symbols, a lot of these spans of time and and part of the reason I'm presenting this series is, is that things were unfolding gradually in our understanding of these things. So the foundation was being laid upon which later we would make the prediction addressing uh, July 18, 2020 and, and November 9th, 2019 and December 25th, 2021, what, what we were expecting to happen. And these were based upon a foundation that had been laid. Uh, obviously, without an understanding of uh, the chronology of the 391 and a half years of the kings of Judah, when Tess came up with the November 9th, 2019 date, and I was there on October 13th and measured 391 and a half days, if I didn't know uh, the spans of the kings of Judah, it being 391 and a half days wouldn't have meant as much I might have connected it to the prophecy of Josiah Litch, but we needed to know that there's 391 and a half years of the kings of Judah. And and we had connected to that, that to Josiah Litch already in 2016. So there was all of these, these things that were being put in place. Now, I have always said that the, the center of all Bible prophecy, uh, the nexus in which all of these things are connected to is the 70th week. So the 70th week is the most important structural chiasm because it, the cross of Christ is the thing that seals up all vision and prophecy, right? As you see in, in Daniel 9 verse 24. So there are these six things that the 70 weeks are, are meant to accomplish, you know, the finishing of transgression, the making the end of sins making reconciliation for iniquity, the bringing in of everlasting righteousness, and the anointing of the most holy. But to seal up vision and prophecy is, from a prophetic point of view, an extremely important part of the 70 weeks. So all of the other things are important as well, of course. But in order to know that Christ is the promised Messiah, that Jesus was indeed the promised Messiah, we need this time prophecy. And this has been undermined within Adventism. That is, uh, they've undermined both the 70 weeks and the 2300 days. And of course, they don't accept the 2520 and they don't accept, accept the 391 years and 15 days of Revelation 9, etc. So uh, generally speaking, there would be few Adventist scholars um, who would accept the 391 years and 15 days. Uh, there might be some, of course, who are still going to accept the 70 weeks and the 2300 days. But definitely the 2520 is, is connected to this. Now in, 
2013, I had um, done a series of presentations in Alberta. It was at uh, Sylvan Lake. And um, uh, these presentations, I'm just going to bring them up here. So obviously that was uh, prior to the work that I had done in 2014. So in 2014 is when I'm really going to put together uh, a lot of this chronology. But what I was looking at in 2013 was, let me see if I can find it here quickly, uh, was the connection between the book of Daniel and Leviticus 26. So obviously I'd, I'd come into the movement. I was interested in the 2520. And as I had begun looking at Leviticus 26, uh, I came to recognize its connection to the book of Daniel. And I'm in the wrong folder. That's not going to help me. Okay, so I'll find this here real quick. Okay, so this would be the most recent. Okay, so sorry about that. So connections between Leviticus 26 and the book of Daniel. So it, it was written in a sort of a bombastic style. I was trying to be scholarly and all that stuff. But um, in this here, I'm going to show these connections between uh, Leviticus 26. I go through a, a detailed analysis of the book itself. And this is when I'm going to make my first uh, charts. And I show that there is in Leviticus 26 this these four lines of prophecy in the book of Daniel. I go through my initial understanding of the kings of Judah, um, up to Artaxerxes' decree. Um, and this you can find on my academia site. Um, I'm going to analyze uh, each of the, the chapters of the book of Daniel. And I'm just trying to find this chart here. So one of the things that, that I first found was um, we actually were doing a Bible study at Kelly's place when he was living in Calgary. And we got a whiteboard and Peter Plum was there. And uh, we started writing out the nouns that were in the book of Leviticus or Leviticus 26 and the nouns that were in Daniel chapter four. I don't know if you remember that, Kelly, but uh, anyway. And what we found is that seven times is mentioned four times in Leviticus 26 and seven times is mentioned four times in Daniel four. Leviticus 26. Yeah. Okay. I had to find the mute button. Uh, yeah, I, I might even have that on the whiteboard still unerased. Really? From that long ago? I'm, ser I'm, ser I'm serious. It was a study I, when Peter was there. I, yeah, it might be. <laughs> uh, okay. A small little. Well, that was 2000. So that was 2012. You can tell I wasn't doing that too often. <laughs> okay. It might have been. Well, it might have been. I think it was 2012 or 2013. Anyway, I think it was 2012. But. Sounds well, right. That's when Peter was coming over, teaching me about the twenty-five twenty, and he'd bring yeah. over, I'd, I'd say, a good twelve-inch stack of books, and I would fall asleep, and <laughs> he would finish, and <laughs> and then you called me and asked me about the twenty-five twenty, and if I knew anything about it, and why I hadn't told you about it before, yeah. and I went, oh, I guess it might be something to it. I should look at it more. And yeah, that <laughs> kind of woke me up. Yeah. So, so anyway, we, we looked at these parallels. You know, your heaven shall be as iron and your earth as brass, the band of iron and brass, right? And, of course, uh, this can also refer to sort of the fact that it's uh, um, your land shall not yield your increase. So it has to do with your heaven is iron is earth is brass. It's not going to rain, right? Um, uh, your land shall not yield her increase, neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. The tree grew, was strong, and height thereof reached unto heaven, the sight thereof to the end of all the earth, and the leaves thereof were fair, and the fruit thereof much. You got wild beasts, let his portion be with the beasts, I will scatter you among the heathen, scatter his fruit, cut down, hew down, bands and band, beasts and beasts, uh, brass and brass, earth and earth, enemies, Field, fruit, heaven, iron, pride, scatter, tree. So these nouns are there in Daniel chapter 4, just as they are there in Leviticus 26. So there's this connection be between Leviticus 26 and Daniel and the book of Daniel. And so that was the whole basis of this paper was, you know, that there's this connection between uh, Leviticus 26 and 
and the book of Daniel. So I go through each of the chapters. I show some of these parallels. Uh, there's another chart I have. Uh, it's a little further down. Let's see if I can find it. Yeah, this one here where I have uh, Leviticus 26, the pride of power, wild beast, the famine, the 70 years. And you can parallel this with the uh, four uh, lines of prophecy here. Uh, Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, and Daniel 9 to 12. Um, so obviously uh, Daniel 9 is going to deal with the 70 years and the 490 years of probation, right, which is based on Leviticus 26, the 70 years of rest. And then um, Daniel's narrative, Nebuchadnezzar's pride, is a base seven times prophecy. Daniel 6, the law of the Medes and the Persians, uh, has to do with civil authority. Uh, Daniel 3, the counterfeit worship, the Sunday law test is a parallel there. And Daniel 5 deals with the destruction of Babylon. Um, and then we also have just the kingdoms themselves, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome, uh, parallel uh, the symbols. Babylon has to deal with pride. Media, Persia has to deal with law. Greece has to deal with philosophy. And uh, Rome is this assimilation of nations with their characteristics, right? So it's a repeat. It's a three-one combination. And um, so, <clears throat> so, so there was all of these studies. But what I really want to focus on is is something that, uh, going back to this diagram, is the week of Christ and how this ties everything together. And I, I don't know. It ties so many things together. It, it's kind of difficult to, you know, uh, to do it in one presentation because there's so many thoughts that come into mind. But of course, we'll look at the obvious things first. Uh, so we see on the 1863 chart, they're going to show the 70 weeks. Um, so they're going to show the seven weeks, the 62 weeks and the one week. Right. And then below that, they're going to have this. Or I think, I think that's how they do it. I'm trying to remember. I could look at the charts, I guess. Let me see if I can quickly find that, how this is done. Hmm. I don't see the 1863 chart here in this folder. Oh, yeah, here it is. Yeah, so they're going to have, I'll just show you quickly. It's not the best picture. It's just a black and white picture of the chart, but... Hopefully you can see that at the top you got the 490 and the 810 years making up the 2300 days. Then you have the 70 weeks, the 7, the 62, and the 1. And then they show this one week. And so that one week is the week of Christ. And what's hidden in that week is the 2520. Now, of course, we can see obviously three and a half, three and a half. That's two twelve sixties, two forty two months, however you want to look at it, and so it makes up twenty five twenty. But of course, we know that's as a symbol. Literally, it is not exactly three and a half years, and definitely, literally, it's not twelve hundred and sixty days. Now, maybe some people might argue that we need to count it that way. We would have to say, well, I'm going to count from the cross. I'm going to count twelve hundred and sixty years back. And that's going to be when Jesus was baptized. And then they, they could try to argue that then I'm going to count 1260 days from the cross. And that's going to mark when Stephen was stoned. The problem with that is we've shown, uh, in other places that, uh, the 70 week or the 70 weeks begins on the 10th day of the seventh month. And we find this from these chiasms in the story of Ezra. And uh, so we know these chiastic structures, these prophetic mirrors are are biblical, right? Christ's week, we got uh, 430 years, that's 215 years in two periods in in the story of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the Israelites. So I think we have a strong case for the idea that the 70th week starts on the 10th day of the seventh month and not 1260 days before the cross. Uh, and then we would also have that uh, there's uh, 1,260 days to the stoning of Stephen, but it's going to be an extra four days in there. So it's going to be 1,264 days. 
So it's just something that, that we found as we went through the chronology of this. Now, what you see below that week is I just have, so this is the final covenant week of Christ as seen on the 1863 chart. And what I have is these calculations. So to the left is what you see on the 1843 chart. That's how the 2520 is calculated. Seven times 12 is 84. And, and then they multiply it by 30, the number of days in a month, uh, to get 2520. That is, they don't go seven times 360 equals 2520 on the 1843 chart, which, which I find kind of interesting that they did it this way. I, I only found one place in the Millerite writings where they ever gave this calculation. Normally, they just say seven times 360. But on the 1843 chart, they're going to to have that calculation. Okay. Now, on the right, uh, what I did is I took the 1843 chart and I just did some copying and pasting. And I, and I, instead of the seven and 12 as the way that they have it, like the seven times, I'm saying the seven represents a week. And 12 represents the symbol of the covenant. And together they are 84. 7 times 12 is 84. So the same idea. But instead of 30 days for a month, I put 31 AD, the midst of the week. So we have 84 months there, right? And 31 AD is the middle of those 84 months. And so if you multiply 84 by 31, you get 2,604. Now, why is that number important? 26th day, fourth month. Okay, so it does symbolize the 26th day of the fourth month, correct. But it's also important because it represents the prophetic mirror itself, right? So if I go through here, uh, now this brings the prophetic mirror and the week of Christ together. So if you're not familiar with what we're looking at here, what we have is we have um, the week of Christ on the top. <clears throat> we have uh, some some dates. This is probably not the best one to look at. Maybe I'll go here first, and we'll get there. So you can see if I count 1,260 days back from the cross, it's going to be 46 days short of the 10th day of the seventh month in 27 AD, which we would say that's when Jesus is is baptized, right? And then if I count uh, past the cross 1260 days, it, it's going to bring me to October 8th. But the 10th day of the seventh month is October 12th in 34 AD. Uh, so it's four days short on that side. Of course, you should see four plus 46 is 50. And so obviously, if you look at the bottom, it says 12, 25, 69 days. That would be a cardinal count. Um, the other one's an inclusive count. So, so there are problems trying to make this a, a literal period. So if I, if I look here, so there's a few different things going on. So just try to look at what we have on the top is the week of Christ. And you can see that 46 years on the left side. Now we just zoom in a bit. So you got the 46 years and that's going to bring you to on the bottom. What I've done is I've put the cross lined up with 538 AD, right? So that's the two 1260s of uh, the counterfeit covenant week of the of Rome, right, of pagan and papal Rome, the two desolating powers. So you can see it on the right here, it's, it's going from right to left. 723 BC is going to be 1260 days or 1260 years to 538. And then there's 1260 years to 1798, right? So it's just laying that down on top of it in reverse. So the week of Christ is going to go from left to right chronologically, as we usually look at timelines. And the counterfeit 2520, right? The, week, the counterfeit week of Christ, the 2520 for northern Israel is going to go from right to left. And we can see how that 46 days lines up with the 46 years. And the prophetic mirror itself if we go from 1863, which is going to be September 11th in 27 AD, and you go back to 742 BC on the right there, that's going to line up with October 27th in 34 AD. But that's 2,604 days. And 
it lines up with the 2,604 years of the prophetic mirror, right? I, I think this should be clear to most people who understand uh, the 2520. So this week of Christ, what we see here as a symbol, shows that Christ is the center of our message, that this isn't really about the numbers, right? Just like the seven weeks, is it about the numbers? Is there something special about the numbers that gives us salvation? No, it's a witness to our souls of of God, of Telmoni. Yeah, no, not about the numbers. Yeah, so, so Christ is giving a witness that he is in control of the sun and the moon and the stars, the time clock that God gave us, that he's in control of time, he's control in control of history, of events, both on, on a, you know, let's say, a cosmic scale, and also in our personal lives, right? That's one thing that we've seen in this symbolic use of numbers. Now, some people would try to attribute what we're doing to numerology, and, and I know people, I've known people in the past who were into numerology. I met this one lady when I was uh, going door to door selling my scripture song albums, and she was into the Kabbalah, which is Babylonian mysticism and numerology, or Jewish mysticism, uh, I guess, but from Babylon. And, uh, you know, she had changed her name to some name that added up to a certain number, so it would make her rich. And I happened a few years later to go to her house after witnessing to her um, of what I thought and selling her a scripture song. Uh, she was now a Christian and uh, and not into numerology anymore. So I, I thought that was interesting. And I don't usually go to the same neighborhood, you know, twice in a row, but I did uh, uh, happen to go there again and, and ran into the same person, usually People have moved out by the time I show up uh, the second time around. So it's it's rather interesting that um, you know that you know one is we have we have these numbers, but we can't control God. We can't you know change our name so that it adds up to a certain the gematria as some special number, and that's going to make us rich. That would be numerology. It's using numbers in a magical way, and it's a counterfeit, right? Would be a counterfeit of something that God has given. Because God has given numbers as symbols, but we can't control our destiny by, you know, doing things in a certain number. And so, so we're not saying that we don't definitely believe in numerology, but we do believe that God can reveal things to us through numbers as long as they are in accordance with his written word. That is, God is not going to use numbers to teach us something that contradicts the Bible in any way. Right? So if somebody believes something about, you know, has a belief based upon some numbers uh, and then it contradicts God's word, then it would not be valid. Right? So all of what we did in studying these symbolic use of numbers was studying Bible prophecy and finding these symbols. So the 2,604 years of the prophetic mirror is just a fact that we have from the prophetic mirror. But it does become a symbol of the 26th day of the fourth month, which we later get. So all of these symbols are tied to the week of Christ. The other thing that we see here in taking the literal week of Christ, uh, one of the most important things was 70 AD, that it's 460 years prior to 538, and that there's 460 days from the time that Jesus is crucified to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, destruction of the temple specifically. And and that period of time gives witness to this prophetic mirror, the way that it's drawn out, because the 10th day of the fifth month happens to be in line with 70 AD. Now, I generally put it as August 6th now, but... um, just depends whether you're counting how you're counting that 468 days. I, I believe it's actually August. So I think what it is. Oh, I remember now. So in 70 AD, it's going to be August 6th. But in 32 AD, it's going to be August 7th. That's the 10th day of the fifth month. That's why it says August 7th. I always get confused about that. 
So 32 AD to the 10th day of the fifth month is August 7th. In 70 AD, the 10th day of the fifth month is August 6th. So it's actually August 6th, but it's the 10th day of the fifth month date that's the important date there. So that's when the temple is going to be destroyed in 70 AD, right? But this is, is marking 32 AD because it's marking seven years from 27 AD to 34 AD, right? So that might confuse people. It confuses me once in a while. Okay. <clears throat> now, we know that this 2,604 prophetic mirror, that this, that this comes from the 20, 22520s. So this is something that in 1856, we're going to have uh, Hiram Edson do a series of articles on the times of the Gentiles. And he's going to argue that the 2520 that we should recognize is the one from 723 BC to 1798. And, and that Miller's 2520, you know, is not what's being referred to. But we know that both 2520s are valid because one's for northern Israel and one's for Judah. And that when we put them together, we end up with the prophetic mirror. Any questions about this? About what you're, what we see? Because we've gone over this before. So hopefully people, you know, watching this understand it. Now, if somebody doesn't know about the prophetic mirror and the 22520s, this might not mean much to them. But this is something that developed in our understanding. Now, we know that from this week of Christ study, we ended up with, so this is, uh, you know, this chart I did back in 2018. So in 2018, I had recognized this and I thought, well, can we continue on the bottom to count the years on our calendar? and line them up with the dates in, in 27 AD. And, and as far back as you can go to 27 AD is the first day of the first month. So in 27 AD, uh, the first day of the first month is going to be March 28th, right? Jesus gonna, is going to be cru crucified. Uh, is that right? Am I doing that right? Uh, first day of the first month is March 28th. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, no, never mind. Yeah. So that's in, in 27 AD. Yeah. OK. Now I have to still think about it. Yeah. So in 27 AD, March 28th is the first day of the first month. Right. Now, Jesus is going to be crucified, not in 27 AD, but 31 AD. Right. Three and a half years later. So as far as I could go back, the farthest I could go back in 27 AD is to the first day of the first month. Now, originally, I wasn't doing that. I was looking at, like, the 12th day of the first month, and the, you know, because that would be the, the betrayal that's going to be 2019. And the 10th day of the first month lines up with 2021, and the 9th day of the first month lines up with 2022. Yes, I remember, remember Aldo Malchazin. Yeah, uh, Kelly. And then we got uh, the first day of the first month there. Now, in 2030... The first day of the first month is April 5th. And, and so back in 2018, I saw this, uh, but I didn't think anything of it because I wasn't looking that far into the future, 2030. And, and I didn't believe that we can, you know, predict the second coming of Christ. I think I actually had under their second coming, but that was more, not, I wouldn't call it a joke, but just what could that possibly be? Maybe, maybe the second coming's around then or something. But I wasn't looking that far into the future. Now, we know that when we look at the, the chronology of Ezra, that we end up with this 354 days. So, and that chronology of Ezra connects us to the first day of the first month in um, 2030, right? So we've, we've gone through this before. And so when we're dealing with a symbolic use of numbers, we have a date in the future, April 5th, 2030. So what do we make of that? What do some people do? We have a date in the future. What is our natural tendency to do? So wait and see what, what was doing that date. Okay, well, is that date a date that we expect an event? Not really. 
Yeah. So I don't think that we should look at it as something's going to happen on April 5th, 2030. It is a symbolic date. And we've connected it in various ways uh, to an extension of time for this movement. That is what God is illustrating, not in a literal sense. We're not saying that we have till 2030, you know, to get our act together. But what is God has been illustrating is that the time that we are in right now is not the time that we thought it was. The lines that we had are symbolic of something that's going to happen in the future. And it points forward to these symbols in the future. So in, in the morning studies, we've looked at this a little bit more because the symbol of the first day of the first month in the story of Ezra is the end of the divorcement. So they're going to start on the first day of the 10th month. Yeah, and then they're going to end on the first day of the first month. And we're saying already that uh, this period that we're in, 2024, is already representing that divorcement has occurred, that there has been a divorce within the movement that is the separation from the strange wives. And the strange wives represent a method of study that really is a Protestant, apostate Protestant method of study. And that the approach that's being used presently in the movement by Jeff and others is a de departure from the message that we had at the beginning. And, and that seems like a pretty harsh thing to say, that Jeff has actually departed from the method of study that, that he began with. But why do we know that's true? So the method of study that Jeff began with, did it lead to July 18th, 2020? Yeah, for sure. So since that method of study led to July 18th, 2020, the only way that you could reject July 18th, 2020 was to adopt a different method of study, right? That's right. Okay. Or reject or reject the past method of study. Right. So, uh, and, so, and, so, and, so I, and I believe that uh, marked by your departure, their forced departure from Arkansas. I, I believe that. Yeah, when I was banned from Arkansas, basically, they kicked us out of the School of the Prophets. Yeah. Yeah. To me, in my mind, it marks a rejection of that method of study. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say so. And, and it's not because I'm, I'm, I'm taking it personally or anything like that. It's just, it's just a reality of what they weren't interested in, um, in what, how we were studying and what we were doing. So. Yeah, and giving them the benefit of the doubt as well. It may not have been so much personally, although it was involved, but their minds were darkened by, you know, it, to reject light, our, our minds have to be darkened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's no doubt uh, that that's what happens. So, so, so we looked at the, you know, the, the chronology of Ezra, and that's something that we were presenting, that I was presenting in 2018. Uh, was the chronology of Ezra. There wasn't much interest in it, I always found. It was, I, I found it weird, you know, it was at the School of the Prophets, just the lack of interest by the people who asked me to be there. They just didn't seem interested in anything I had to say. Now, of course, I'm kind of used to that. It's kind of been that way my whole life. It doesn't really bother me. I, I, I would inter interject and say, uh, I can't hold them too responsible. I mean, often I fell asleep during your presentations. <laughs> numbers, numbers, numbers. <laughs> yeah. Well, but I, they I, mean I, something. Yeah. And I, so, so I understand that. But in the studies that I did on Ezra, it wasn't really just numbers, numbers, numbers. I, like there were some pretty profound things being presented, but they just weren't interested in list, even going to the meetings. Right. Yeah. You know, so the way marks that were coming out, way marks and that word and what it, came to mean with, with putting things on the line. It was significant. Yeah. And they would once in a while notice this, but there was a resistance to it. And what I'm trying to say right now is that we have this symbolic date in the future, and we need to recognize that it's a symbol. It connects us to the story of Ezra, to the divorcement. The first day of the first month becomes a specific symbol as a type of close of probation within a line, right? So we know the first day of the first month in 1844, that's the close of probation for the Protestants. That's the, the arrival of the second angel's message. 
And, and then the Millerites are going to be tested under the second angel's message. And, and God is calling us to be tested, right? God has what he has done. We, we could get discouraged about the move, right? The, the, the way things have gone. We could, we could say, well, you know, it's kind of failed and, you know, I'm just going to go elsewhere. But there's really no place else we can go because God has led us and, and we need to, to recognize that and to trust that he's going to continue to lead us and, and leave everything in God's hands. It's just what we have to do. We don't really have much choice. At least I don't think we do. Either we're going to follow God or we're not. And it doesn't make sense to just say, oh, we were all wrong about that. And if it was true that God was not leading us, let's say it's true that God was not leading Jeff. What reason would we have confidence to follow him now? Good point. You know, what what has he done to show that, well, we need, now need to follow him? It, it, it To me, it doesn't make sense. Right. I, I would I have no if, if what he was teaching was error, I would have no reason to have confidence in what he's doing now. And especially since what he's doing now doesn't doesn't really mix with what he was doing before. It's he, he's creating so many di- different contradictions, things that he had rejected as error in the past. He's now teaching as truth and things that he once taught as truth. He is now saying is error. Um, no. So, yeah. No, no, to, no, to consider it. Consider in the realm of possibilities that people can be corrected from error and begin mm-hmm. teaching truth. Yeah, it can happen. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm sure that's what what Jeff believes in his mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, so well, I'm sure sincere, that's what he believes. Sincerely mistaken, I believe. But, the, yeah. but, but people want to put him as just the leader of a movement. Yeah. They yeah, there was quite a it. resurgence of quite a resurgence of interest upon his first uh, public appearance. Yeah, 1260 days after July 18th. Isn't that something? Yeah, so to me, it, it's just kind of, sure, people can change. and and But to just let him just come back into the movement as if nothing has happened and just everybody blindly following him. And then when we look at what he's written, it, it doesn't make sense, right? It's, it's not consistent. It has all kinds of uh, contradictions and in, in, internal uh, contradictions. And so we would need to be more objectively evaluated. And especially since, you know, it's pretty obvious that he's paralleling what happened in Millerite history. And as Colin said, you know, it's, it's tempting to think, you know, that he's just Miller. And it's not a temptation. It's just the reality. I mean, it's what we would have expected if we're repeating Millerite history. And there is no parallel to Miller being misled for a period of time and then coming back to the truth again, right? What we have is Miller no, doing what Jeff laid to rest. Yeah, he, being laid to rest. Save him from the influences. Yes. So, I mean, it's and, up and, to and Jeff was de- deeply influenced, yeah. as you've mentioned many times there. Mm-hmm. You know, he would listen to others, but listen to others about things and that not actually do the fact check. Right. And and this is the thing about repentance, the repentance, you know, that Dwight presented and and that that we have to consider is we definitely need to repent, but we have to repent of the right things, right? We have to repent of the things in our character that have caused this disappointment to just say, well, the disappointment happened because we got the wrong date or we shouldn't have set dates at all. I mean, the parallel to Millerite history would be what happened with the majority of Adventists. They just, we got the wrong date, you know, or we shouldn't have set time, you know, that type of thing. So we have a date in the future, but we don't believe in time setting. That date in the future is a symbol. So we can't look at, you know, April 5th, 2030 is, you know, something's going to happen on that day or, or anything like that. Christ could come back before then. We just know that we, God has extended the time for us. So the thing that I really want people to come away with, with this study on the symbolic use of numbers, is that that the numbers themselves are not the issue. It's what God has revealed in his word. And he has given these things as an objective witness. They they are not salvational in and of themselves. The numbers have no magical powers. But Christ is the Palmoni, the wonderful number. And and he uses these prophetic periods. They, They become part of the symbols of our time and we've been using them 
in the morning studies, things like the Strong's numbers and, and finding that these, they confirm the interpretation that we have for the present truth application of Daniel chapter 11 and 12. And that's what's imp important is that they're confirming something that God has shown from his word. They are not something that we use to discover new secret hidden truths that contradict the plain readings of God's word. And there are that's people very well put. Yeah. And there are people that's out there. Well who keep, yeah, there. Thank you. There are people out there who um, continue to look at dates. They, they look at spans of time and they, claim that something's going to happen on this and that date. When it passes, they just set some other date, people in this movement, and they won't listen to me. They just want to keep setting dates um, and not understanding that, you know, you could have a symbolic date in the future, that it's going to tie and confirm our history. But to have it you know, as a as some predictive event, we know we cannot predict the future using chronology, that there are things that are hidden from us, we are to watch and wait. We are to measure the time and these this time. And as events unfold, we can see where God is leading us. But to predict events in the future, uh, that would go against the counsels in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. I, I would like to put it this way that, uh, that it confirms God's leading in our past. And by mm -hmm. faith, not seeing it, we follow. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it still takes faith. The numbers still take faith, right? They don't they don't take away the need for faith, but they help confirm our faith, these dates and this chronology. For this movement at this time, God has given us these numbers as a witness. Now, you know, one of the problems, of course, I have with that, I know not everybody's a numbers person. And, and that was sort of the complaint at the School of the Prophets. Like, I can't remember all these numbers. And, you know, and of course, some people can. I can't, but they couldn't. And they, they felt it was some kind of a burden that they had to look at these numbers and these dates and, and remember them. But the thing is, they didn't have to figure it out. You know, that, that would be the hard part, figuring out all this chronology. Having to, to understand a few dates and numbers is not such a big deal. Yeah, as Kelly says, five out of four people struggle with math. Anyway, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for this study and thank you for the Sabbath for your continued blessing uh, throughout this day. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.